We all have a creative part of our brain, whether we use it or not, for generating new ideas, problem solving, and just viewing ourselves in this world. I am Ricky McEachran, an artist living in Chicago, and I am eager to know and share with you all how people of a creative leaning have brought this way of thinking to the forefront and how it has shifted outcomes. When I was a project manager, my team and I often would need to identify priorities. We would have a set of issues, action items, or potential projects, and we needed to decide where to spend our limited resources. One common way to do this was simple. We would rank each item as a one, a two, or a three. One being most important, and three being least important. Very often, the results came back with a predominant number of items listed as one. Most important. Everything is important. I would often say, if everything is most important, then everything is least important. What I meant was, not everything can be the top priority. If one thing isn't truly given the required attention above others, the results will not be optimal. There will be unrealized potential. But that means something has to give. Something has to fall away and get less attention. Identifying a specific and small set of ones will yield results. These priorities can be set in the context of the next hour. In the next hour, what do I need to focus all of my attention on? In the context of a week, what are the two things that, above all else, absolutely must be accomplished this week? And this mindset can be applied to the year or our whole adult life. To me, it is great hearing people's stories where it is clear that their ones have been defined and are limited in number. I was connected to Siobhan through a previous Eager to Know guest, April Hall. April and I have actually known each other professionally for many years, back when I was a project manager, and after our episode launched, I reached out to her and said, I want to interview someone who's involved in fitness for a living. She suggested Siobhan. Siobhan and I had a quick chat on the phone. I usually do this with guests I have never met before for a couple reasons. First, I need to be sure that their communication style will read properly in the audio-only format of podcasting. Secondly, I need to get a general idea of their story. What are the main areas I need to cover? I don't get into details. I save that for the podcast, but I need to be sure I am aware of all of the key elements of their story so I can plan the conversation and pace things properly. I try to keep my entire recording within 45 minutes with as little edit as possible, so having this upfront conversation is helpful. So when Siobhan and I started our recording, we did not know each other. Once things got going, what a wonderful surprise. What I learned from Siobhan's story is that she has identified just a few ones, a few top priorities, a few things that she values above other things. She has gathered a lot of experience through the challenges life serves us all, and she has decided, moving forward, what was going to get the most time and attention and what falls away. The results are inspiring and impressive. I am happy to share my conversation with entrepreneur and fitness trainer, Siobhan Hodges. Siobhan, if you could tell me a little bit about your fitness company. So I started a fitness company. It's called Grills and Granola. And the whole idea is to make fitness more accessible for people in my community using trap music. And your, tell me about your community. What would that be? So my community, um, I am an African-American woman and I come from a low-income neighborhood where people don't have a lot of access to mental health care resources um, or even like fitness programs. So I created a class that leverages trap music that is lower in cost than most uh, fitness classes. Um, and it kind of just helps people feel better. Nice. Yeah, I think the connection between mental health and fitness is really important. Um, is, I'd love to talk about that some more. Can you tell me that? So that's very interesting to me. Can you talk about that? Like, how did you make that mapping between mental health and fitness? Sure. So it was the year 2015. And um, I was going through a divorce at the time because I foolishly decided to get married at a really young age. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> I spent my weekends at the club just like drinking and partying with my mm -hmm. girlfriend trying to get chose. And then during the weekdays, I would go to the gym because I wanted my body to be banging so I could get chose. 
But what I learned was that alcohol is a depressant. Mm -hmm. So it was making me feel worse. Yes. Um, I also have a panic disorder. And when I when I have like these issues with anxiety, alcohol is like the number one thing that just puts me over the edge. So I decided to spend more time in the gym. Um, and while I was going through all this heartbreak and spending time in the gym, I was listening to this album called What a Time to Be Alive by Drake and Future. And it really started to make me feel better, the exercise and the music. So what I had learned was that uh, when you exercise, you're actually giving your body the opportunity to uh, distribute oxygen throughout your brain and other parts of your body more efficiently. Um, you're also producing hormones that make you feel better. And so for me, it was a great way for me to manage my panic disorder and just feel better and have mental clarity. So from there, I decided to become a certified fitness instructor, create my own class, um, and just, you know, just start sharing this, this amazing thing with the world. <laughs> okay, that is amazing. I'm so glad that we're talking. Um, so can you tell me about, do you mind if we talk about the alcohol part of it? I'm curious about that. Okay, so um, obviously alcohol has a reputation of being something that is very helpful. And it kind of, it, it helps people um, connect. It helps people, um, you know, potentially look at problems or stressful situations in a fresh way. Um, I know I used to, when I was going through difficulties with guys, I would go to my friend's house, my best friend's house, and we would just like drink wine and like talk about, you know, our, our men problems. And it kind of felt like thing, it was being helpful, like it was actually solving our problems. I'm realizing now it really doesn't. Um, it sounds like you may have had that uh, a similar realization. Is, is that accurate? When I would drink, my whole goal was to get trashed and forget all of my problems. But that that's a short term solution. Um, and I'm learning that, you know, you have to play for the long term and long term alcohol is not where it's at. It dehydrates you um, and it makes your body feel like trash and it makes you depressed. I don't need that in my life. Yeah. Now, your panic disorder, was that something that was uh, a thing that you were experiencing before the alcohol or how did the two play together? I think that I've had a panic disorder my entire life since I was a kid. But because I grew up with seven siblings in a single parent household, there was no way that I would ever see a therapist. Um, There's no way that my mom could afford to see to send me to a therapist so that I can get diagnosed. I actually was officially diagnosed in college when I had like a complete nervous breakdown um, while I was just trying to, you know, pay for school and also do my full time course load. And then the alcohol, I didn't really make that connection until I went through this major divorce where every single mental issue I've had, it just got became aggravated. Mm. Um, but the alcohol became I started to make that link between alcohol and like me feeling even more anxious than I normally do. Okay. So when I was drinking, the panic attacks, they were um, occurring more frequently. And when I stopped drinking, it actually just kind of minimized them. Gotcha. Now, I assume the panic attacks would happen when you were not, like when you were hungover or something like that. I'm assuming they would not be happening when you were ingesting alcohol. Is that correct? Which were happening every, at every single moment, except for when I was drinking the alcohol. Because they always come, sometimes I can feel when they're about to happen, and then other times I don't know. Um, and usually the ones that I can feel when they're about to happen, it's because I'm biologically just jacked up, and usually it's the alcohol and being hungover. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So the whole fitness thing, is that something that you had had in your life in the past, or was it something that you recently discovered athlete for most of my life. But then I took a bit of a break from all of that when I got my first job out of college. Um, and then it took it took me going through like a depression and, you know, just having this long prolonged anxiety to actually get back into it. So you said that you were you were an a athletic or earlier in your life? Yeah. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. was, did you know that, you know, physical activity was a like a healer for you or it made you feel better? Had you, were you aware of that at that time? Oh, and it was never even positioned that way to me. I literally joined my first sports team because my parents thought that I was socially awkward and wanted me to make friends. So what was the first uh, sport or athletic thing that you did when you were younger? 
the first sport I played. Uh, I was a cheerleader for my older brother's football team. Okay. And did it work? It did. Okay, great. So you have all of these life experiences with, in a lot of these life experiences sound like they're not uncommon for people. You have, um, you know, it sounds like you grew up in a somewhat, I'm assuming uh, you didn't use this word, but a chaotic household. Uh, it sounds like you had a lot of siblings and it was um, maybe not getting, Is was it chaotic? Is that Was that a, a, a fair description? <laughs> chaotic it was chaotic in the sense that there was a lot of noise and a lot of people talking all at once okay. but very structured in in like how we showered you know you had five minutes in the shower every all the food was rationed um and okay. that way it was disciplined okay all right cool um so you had this you had this um childhood where you may not there could have been some things that you that didn't get attention um, that could have, which is, you know, obviously very common. Uh, I think you'd probably agree with that, that people have experiences yeah. like that. Um, and then you had a life experience around uh, a heartbreak in a divorce, which is even more than a heartbreak, which is, I've never been married or divorced, but, um, so I can imagine that is more than devastating. And then experience with trying to make yourself feel better with a variety of things, including, you know, alcohol and then these all kind of came to a head for you and you realized like it wasn't working and you wanted to do something different. Is that, is that a fair summary? That is the most accurate summary I've heard before. <laughs> okay. That's why they pay me the big bucks for the, for the podcast. Um, <laughs> so what's interesting is you took all of this and you tried and you're doing something with it um, to not only help people, but also to make a business for yourself. That's pretty, a lot of, most people don't do that. Most people have experiences similar to what you've had and they don't make a business out of it. Where did that come from? That you are, that you thought that like, where do you get the nerve that you can actually do something like that and make a business out of your experience that's going to help people? Wow. You know, I've never really thought of where it came from, but I will say that I was at the lowest point in my life and I needed to keep myself busy so that I wouldn't even deal with all of the pain that I was going through. So I think my inspiration was just being at feeling like I was at rock bottom, honestly. Um, and then naturally it just became this pro project that I got obsessed with. Um, and then I don't know, I just, I just, I wrote everything down and I said, you know what, I'm just going to do this and hold myself accountable because I have absolutely nothing to lose and I can't go any lower than I, than I was feeling at that time. So when you said you wrote it down and you were going to do this, what was this? I was going to launch this fitness class. That, that was my only goal. I said, I, I, I gave myself nine months. I wrote a project plan because professionally I work in the ad industry. So project plans are where it's at. Um, but I wrote the project plan and I said, you know what, I don't know what, what's going to come of this, but I'm just going to launch this fitness class and see where it goes. And it has evolved into so much more than that. Um, but that, that's all I wanted to do was just like, I'm going to do this class and I'm going to look great. And my ex, fuck him. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think I agree with you because I'm a former project manager. So, and I used to work in, um, you know, internet consulting. Um, so I know that a project plan is key <laughs> to, at least for me, and sounds like for you as well to make things happen, but it sounds, but it sounds like there's probably a, from what I'm hearing is not worrying about the results, but worrying about my vision and the plan and sticking to the plan and kind of letting go of the results. Is that a fair assessment? Letting go of the results. I'm, I'm never, I was never doing this for monetary gain. I was doing it as a way that I wanted to prove to myself that I could do something bigger than me. Nice. And again, I, I kind of asked this question before, um, that kind of mindset, is that something that you've always had or was, did you surprise yourself that you were able to behave in this way to do this? I would say that I, 
in some ways I have always had this mindset. Mm. I've always been an overachiever um, academically, yep. but that's because it was drilled into my head that school is where it's at and this is how you're going to achieve upward mobility. Um, so yeah, I would say that's always kind of been in my head is to just try to do my absolute best regardless of the outcome. Nice. So tell me about your experience now and your, uh, your fitness company. T- tell me about it and um, what is it like? Are you spending a lot of time in the books? Are you spending time teaching classes? Are you engaging with your customers? I'd just like to hear about it. Yeah, so I'm I'm spending a lot of my time right now. I am re-strategizing because I want to offer more more types of classes. But um, I'd say for the past three years, I spent so much time teaching fitness classes. I taught it at Facebook, Tumblr. I traveled with it most recently to Atlanta um, for a business business women's expo. I'm going to South by South next um, South by Southwest next year. So I really have just been spending a lot of time teaching classes, connecting with other fitness professionals um, and and making them more aware of what my class looks like. Uh, And then also connecting with people online and like really pushing my brand ethos and and just trying to build my community. That's that's where most of my time has been spent lately. Okay, great. So it sounds like it's not only about the fitness aspect of it, but it's about connecting with other people. As a group fitness, um, it's heavily built on community and, and how Chop Aerobics has evolved from just being a fitness class is that when I was teaching for the past, like two, the first two years, I was teaching the class nonstop once a week, tiring myself out. And I started to meet all of these other women who were into fitness and into trying to feel better. So I f- figured that I would bring them all together. So then I launched a wellness conference called Zenday. And I've brought together over 150 plus women from my community and over 15 businesses and had Athleta and then Under Armour come in and sponsor sponsor the conference and just connect all of these amazing people. So it's it's evolving. And now I am trying to reach more people by making the class digital. So what does that mean? It's going to be on uh, like uh, Apple TV or something? The plan is to integrate um, content into all of these new streaming platforms that exist um, within the fitness space because the new trend is that a lot of people um, are not going to the gym. They're actually going to start bringing the gym to them. So my plan is to record um, a trap aerobics video and just start getting that content integrated onto streaming platforms. Um, And then we've also recently introduced a way for people to stream the class live while we're teaching it so they can join us and take it from from home. You're nonstop. <sighs> yes. Unfortunately, I cannot stop going now. Once I start, I just keep connecting more dots and it just makes me want to keep creating. That's, that's amazing. Do you consider this whole endeavor, um, do you look at it as a creative endeavor? Absolutely. I do think it, it's a creative endeavor because it didn't exist uh, prior to me doing it. So I did create something. I love that answer. <laughs> I love that answer. Because a lot of times, um, you know, I have people on this podcast and it's, you know, conversations with people of the creative leaning. And I will, you know, I will talk to people about being on the podcast and they are in a role that is not considered traditionally creative. They're not a photographer. They're not an actor. Um, and I think that the way, you know, the way I look at creativity is exactly what you said, like, is you are, you start somewhere and at the end of whatever you're doing, something new that did not exist before, um, is there. And, you know, that is a creative process and whether it's a innovative business that's helping people and helping you like heal yourself or whether it's a painting, it's, you know, I consider it all creativity. And I think I'd love to see people to look at really their lives in that way um, as through a creative lens. I agree. I think that we often get caught up in the label of, oh, a creative is someone who makes, I don't know, posters and videos and does photography and makes art. 
But you know what? I don't I don't think that creative is a label. It's just it's an adjective. So that means that anyone can be creative. A lawyer can be creative. A data scientist can be creative. We got to get rid of that. Those labels. Yeah, I, I complete completely agree with you. Um, one thing that I personally just started doing is uh, I'm sure you make to do lists and goals for the week um, because of what you know. It sounds like you're what you are doing. It requires you to be pretty buttoned up and organized, which would include lists. And one thing that I started to do is I started starring tasks that actually have a physical output or an, uh, have an output that I'm actually creating something. Because what I realized was a lot of my tasks were kind of like busy work. And my list was really big with things that were busy work as opposed to things that had a something that was being produced, whether it was content that I was writing or whether it was a podcast that I was recording. And I kind of kind of shifted my brain to a creative mindset in terms of having an, a product that I created and, you know, and not just a painting. Does that make sense? Makes complete sense. Cool. So what, how do you keep things moving forward for you with all of this stuff going on? How do I keep things moving forward? Uh, well, one, I get help. I, I, I ask for help. Like I recently um, hired a digital marketing intern because I realized I can't take this all on. But something that I do do often is that um, one, I journal because I need mental clarity. And as a person with a panic, panic disorder and a person who has a lot of issues with anxiety, I like to just say that I think more than a lot of other people. I just have an excess amount of thoughts and I have to get rid of them. So I write them down. Um, and then I'm, I'm also always experiencing my life. Like I'm always going out and just trying new things with no expectation. And that helps me connect the dots and, and continue to move forward with my life and like in all aspects. And I have a lot of conversations with people about random stuff. So it's, it's cool. <laughs> I love those answers. <laughs> you sound very similar to me. That's amazing. Cause I do the exact same things. That's amazing. Uh, I actually, cause I journal too for the same reason, because my brain is so active that I need a place to put it all. And I also, yeah, I mean, that's incredible. Incredible. Do you have any suggestions for people that are listening to this for them, um, to think of things in a more creative way or to embrace their creativity? Um, my number one suggestion my number one suggestion is that you go out and you actually talk to people, get out of your cell phone and have conversations with people who don't look or think like you. Uh, because when you have those conversations, I think that that's where the most inspiration comes from. And also journal. Journaling is a major key. Um, there are a bunch of journal prompts that you can Google on the internet to just activate your brain in different ways. And I find those to be really powerful for me. And my third piece of advice is to uh, just keep your mind open and do the work that you're doing without thinking about the end goal, because it's really not about the destination. It's about the journey. And the journey is where all the, the magic happens, honestly. I concur and agree with that. Where can people learn more about your fitness program? Grills with a Z and granola.com. So grills and granola. Grills as in the gold-plated dentures of hip-hop and <laughs> granola as in the only healthy item you can probably find in a corner store in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we had this conversation. Is there anything else that you think that people should know? Anything that I didn't ask that you want me to ask you that you want to talk about? No, I think, I don't think there's anything else that they should know, but, um, just a piece of advice. It, it gets challenging. Obviously, there are definitely going to be things that happen and are out of your control. And someone recently shared a quote with me that basically said, life is going to throw you waves, meaning those are the fears and the problems just coming to try and ruin your life. And what you should do is you should walk into the wave because when you walk into the wave, you knock the wave down 
And if you run from the wave, the wave will knock you over. So I don't know why I love I love the beach, but that that image has always stuck with me. And that's how I'm able to really just push forward, even when I'm getting pushed back. Well, I think that is a wonderful way to wrap this conversation up. I that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you talking with me today. This was so much fun. My name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast. 